I haven't been this excited since the last new server I got in, which was about four days ago. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. I think the only person more excited to see a new server show up on my doorstep is probably Rambo, mainly because he gets to play in the boxes when I'm all done with them. But let's dive straight into today's find. This is a server I picked up on eBay for $101. However, I also bought a rail kit for it for an additional 47, bringing the total price of this server to 148 bucks. Usually a one use server for around the $100 price point is gonna land you an E3 1200 CPU. Maybe if you're lucky, a dual 1366 arrangement. However, this server is a little bit different. It's rocking dual LGA 2011. That means the server will accept any Xeon E5 2600 V1 or V2 processor, and you can load it up with up to 24 cores and 48 threads. For $100, that's definitely not a bad deal. Considering just a year and a half ago, I was pretty excited to land a dual 2011 motherboard, just the motherboard, for $200. Another big advantage to this server is it is only half depth, meaning you do not need a full depth rack to mount it. In fact, the rails are also adjustable down to that half depth size. However, they will extend out to a full depth rack. And since you all yelled at me last time for not including the actual measurements of the server, I brought a tape measure with me. So the full depth of the server is only 16 and 5 eighths inches, and the rails have a minimum depth of 24 and a quarter by 36 and a half. There you go. Now for this server, you are gonna wanna pick up a set of rails or at the very least a 1U rack shelf. Reason being is you can't actually screw into the rack ears on this server. It has a captive screw on there that is spring loaded and is designed to screw into the rails right here. I would not trust any other mounting mechanism for a server like this, so make sure you have something to support it. Getting into the specs of this system, it is rocking a 1U Chenbro case, much like the file server I reviewed just a couple of weeks ago. However, the word Chenbro is nowhere to be found anywhere on this system. Instead, it's being marketed as a Hive Zeus 1U server. On the front is pretty much nothing but a bunch of speed holes, a power button, and a UID button. Down the side is nothing but the mounting pegs to go into the rails, and around back it is still yet another barren affair, featuring a single VGA port, two USB 2.0s, dual gigabit ethernet, an IPMI port, and a serial port. But let's go ahead and jump inside this thing, because that's where it gets a little bit interesting. Single screw on the back, and the top panel pops right off. Inside the server, we find a fairly custom Supermicro X9 DRD motherboard. Now, I say fairly custom because most of the features on this motherboard have been removed. Normally on this motherboard, you'd find a total of five PCI Express slots. However, in this case, we're left with just a single X16. Now, in a 1U chassis, that definitely makes sense and is a great cost-saving measure to make this server a little bit more affordable. This motherboard also typically comes with 10 SATA ports. However, we're left with just two. Now again, that makes a lot of sense in this chassis, given that there's only two two and a half inch drive bays. In this particular server, we also see a PCI Express X16 riser, so we can actually mount a cart into this box, as well as the two and a half inch drive cage. Now take this with a grain of salt, but I bought two of these servers at the same time. One of the servers came with these accessories, the other did not. But of course, this wouldn't be a craft computing video unless something went wrong. And in this case, one of my servers arrived to DOA. I did reach out to the seller, but have not heard back yet. The problem appears to be a dead motherboard, and I'm hoping to have that resolved pretty quick. Moving on now, you might notice you're not able to see most of this motherboard, and that is because of this very high-tech shroud. Now, I say that slightly sarcastically, but also not sarcastically at all, because if you run this server without the shroud, the CPUs will overheat. However, with the shroud installed, it seems to work just fine, so make sure you're using the shroud. The other thing I find really funny about the shroud is the warning stickers on the front of it. For instance, there's a rotating parts inside as well as an electric shock hazard. However, the way that this is set up, it's not protecting you from either of those. So this goes over the top of the fans like that, and it says rotating parts inside. However, the rotating part that you can actually get your finger stuck in is on the front side of the shroud where the blades are actually exposed. On the back side, they are protected by the fan grill. As far as the electric shock hazard, again, this isn't doing a whole lot to protect you as the power supply and all of the connectors are fully exposed with the shroud installed. 
Anyway, with the shroud removed, we find five 40mm fans at the front of the server, providing all of the cooling for the motherboard and CPUs. Speaking of the CPUs, we do get a pair of heatsinks included with the server, and they are some very beefy full copper units using the narrow ILM mounting pattern. We also have a total of eight DDR3 DIMM slots, providing full registered ECC support and quad channel support for each CPU. The included power supply is a very nice Delta 1U unit, with a 400 watt capacity, an 80 plus gold rating, and custom length cables. Now, the custom length cables are a little bit of a double-edged sword, because you do need custom length cables in a server like this, and I'm glad to see them. However, if you ever needed to replace this power supply, you need to source the exact same length cables on it. The plan for the rest of this video is to fire this thing up and see what we can do with the feature set that's on board. And we're using some pretty basic hardware to get started. I've got a single 60 gigabyte Kingston SSD. I have four 16 gigabyte sticks of 1866 registered DDR3. I know I don't have any quad channel memory right now, so we're gonna run each CPU with dual channel. Sorry. Just in case PCI Express pass-through is supported, I've got a Quadro P400 to see if we can set up a Plex virtual machine with hardware transcoding. And for the CPUs, I have a pair of E5 2698 core 16 thread chips. So let's go ahead and get this thing together and fire it up. Well, if anyone had any hopes of a very home-friendly device like the previous file server that I did, uh, give those up now. This is definitely not a quiet server. In fact, it's living up to all of the expectations I have, usually for 1U boxes. I don't remember if I mentioned which CPUs I was going to be using in this build. I decided to use a pair of Xeon E5 2690 CPUs, which are 8-core, 16 threads, and a base clock of 2.9 GHz. These do have a max turbo of 3.3 GHz and are rated for about 135 watts. Now, 135 watts times 2 is definitely a strong ask for a server like this, but I wanted to give it a worst case scenario. This will definitely give us a great test for both volume and heat of the CPUs. Booting up into the BIOS here, we can see a build date of 2018 for the BIOS version, which isn't too bad actually, considering this server likely was built sometime around 2013. Jumping into our CPU configuration real quick, we'll take a look at both of the chips, and they are indeed both recognized as Xeon E5 2690 CPUs. We can also see right here that Intel VTX technology, which is PCI Express pass-through for Intel Xeons, is supported on this chip. So hopefully we'll have an option for that somewhere in this BIOS. Heading on over to our memory configuration, we can see that all four sticks of 16 gigabytes are recognized as registered ECC, and I did force them into 1866 mode already, so these are running at full speed. A little bit further down in the advanced menu, we can see that both of the network cards on this are Intel i350 gigabit cards. That is pretty good news, as the Intel NIC should be recognized by pretty much every operating system you would ever want to run on here, unlike the previous box where I did have problems getting the NICs running inside of BSD. One feature I am really excited to see on here is the iSCSI configuration. Now an iSCSI drive is a network-based disk that appears to the host as a local disk, meaning you can actually install an operating system and boot from a network drive directly onto a system with no local storage. There are a bunch of other use cases for iSCSI as well, and I'm probably going to be doing at least a couple of videos on it here pretty quickly, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss those. Now, I did go ahead and install Windows 10 on this box, just so we can get some baseline benchmarks ran and take a look at what our temperatures hit. Inside of Hardware Info, we can see that the CPU is actually turboing all the way up to 3.8 GHz under single-threaded workload. However, like I said, I believe the max all-core turbo is around 3.3, so we'll test that here in just a minute. CPU 0 is idling right around 48 degrees right now, although just during boot up, we did hit a max temperature of 71. And very similar on the second CPU, idling about 10 degrees warmer at 54 degrees Celsius, and we hit a max of 72. And last but not least, we can see our DDR3 memory is running at 1866 megahertz at cast latency 13. Pretty solid for a server like this. And yeah, do you remember how I mentioned that these fans are not going to be home friendly? Well, at idle, they're spinning at about 7,000 RPM. They are quite audible in the room right now. And last but not least, our Kingston 60GB SSD is sitting right at 29 degrees, housed right up here in the front of the server. Alright, what do you say about a 10 minute stress test to uh, really get the juices flowing in this thing? We're gonna run Cinebench R23 for 10 minutes on multi-core. Here we go. CPU 2 immediately jumping up to 76 degrees and appears to still be climbing. CPU 1 sitting right around 71. And here we can see both of the package powers sitting right in that 135 to 140 TDP range. 
And if you're wondering about the fans, after just one run of R23, they're spinning at a very healthy 14,300 RPM. It's literally everything I can do right now to not try to yell over the server. I know RTX voice is on, and I know it's picking up my voice just fine, but this is what it sounds like in the room. Okay, that's enough of that. Huh. I just got an amber light on the front. And a beep. What's the beep? Ah, we hit 95C. We got an overtemp alarm. Yay! Interesting, so CPU 1, the left CPU I believe, is sitting at about 84 degrees Celsius. CPU 2, 94. 94 on one chart and uh, 95 on the other. Interesting. So yeah, CPU 1 is still sitting right at 3.3 gigahertz for its max all-core turbo. Uh, CPU 2 has dropped down to 3 gigahertz flat. I think I might have to let this thing finish its run while I'm going up and doing something else. I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, 10 minutes later and the test is all done. Now again, the results are for CPU 1, we managed to stay at that 3.3 GHz boost clock the entire time. However, CPU 2 was a slightly different story, clocking all the way down to 3 GHz for the majority of that test. Now that's not quite thermal throttling, although the clock was definitely being brought down because of thermal issues. Again, CPU 2 did peak at 95 degrees Celsius. However, it's not technically considered throttling because it did not go below the base clock. Had it gone lower than 2.9 gigahertz, that would have been considered throttling. So, not quite the result that I was hoping for, but it's also not the end of the world either. I was hoping to see both of these CPUs stay somewhere in the mid 80s while maintaining that 3.3 gigahertz boost clock. However, for a 1U server with only passive heat sinks, I'll certainly take these results. And just real quick, firing up CPU-Z, I was looking to see if VTX support is enabled by default, and unfortunately I'm seeing that it is not. Here you can see VTX3 is disabled on this motherboard. I wasn't able to find this feature in the BIOS, however I will give that one last look before we call this video done. So unfortunately, according to the Supermicro manual, while VTX is a supported feature of the CPU, and it does list VTX as a supported feature of the motherboard, there's actually no BIOS option in this board to enable VTX. What that means is no PCI Express pass-through for Plex transcoding, no SRIOV support for multiple network cards, or any other fun things that come from dense virtualized machines. I am a little bit bummed that this doesn't have that feature, but again, this is still a pretty fantastic deal for $148, including the rails, or $101 if you just want to stack this on top of a shelf. So I don't think there's anything else I can do in this review other than take it out to the garage, put it on a set of rails, and slide it into the server rack. So that's about the uh, fastest installation of a server into a rack that I've ever done. Those rails are pretty slick. I think I am very pleased with this purchase overall. Now obviously I am a little bit disappointed that PCI Express pass-through is not supported, but at the same time I also got a feature that I didn't expect in iSCSI functionality built directly into the box. For $148, I managed to pick up the 1U server with a dual 2011 motherboard on board and a set of rails. Add in your CPUs, memory, and whatever you want to use for storage, whether it's local SSDs or iSCSI over the network, and you've got a pretty killer little box for not a whole lot of scratch. If you want to pick up one of these servers for yourself, I will have eBay affiliate links down in the video description below. Go give those a look. And on your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already.
Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do and in my server addiction, make sure to follow the links down in the video description to the Patreon or Float Plane. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Ninkasi Brewing Company down in Eugene, Oregon. This is their Otis Oatmeal Stout, a 7.0%. Well, you can smell that grain and malt on there. Not the thickest head in the world, but lots of tiny, tiny bubbles on it. Very, very smooth up front with a little bit of a, a harsh, roasty finish to it. Boy, and if you're not a fan of really rich, straight black coffee, you're probably not gonna like this one. Uh, there's this real roasty, bitter note uh, that's just lingering and lingering. <laughs> you know, this isn't a breakfast stout, but man, I feel like some bacon and eggs right now. Bacon especially. Uh, man, this needs some, some good fatty foods to go alongside with it. If you find yourself in an old leather chair by a fire, put an Otis in your hand. Savor the notes of dark chocolate and roasted oats. Let the moment warm your soul. You know, dark chocolate and roast, that's, that's pretty much what I get.